five to ten minutes. Oh, great. Well, Hi, everyone. We can publish them in a book. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, welcome to Art New York's Fall Forum, for those of you who are here in the room. Um, for those joining us on live stream by HowlRound, we're so happy that you're here. And we're so very excited to be having this conversation today um, with an amazing group of uh, funders here in New York City. Um, before we begin, I'd like to take the time to acknowledge that wherever we are located on Turtle Island, otherwise known as North America, we are on occupied territory. Art New York's membership in the five boroughs of New York City operates on the unceded ancestral land of the Lenape, Wappinger, Canarsie, Rockaway, and Matinecock communities. I want to honor and celebrate all of these indigenous communities, their elders past and present, as well as future generations. I also want to take this time to acknowledge that after there was stolen land, there were stolen people, and we want to honor the generations of displaced and enslaved people that built and continue to build the country we occupy today. We're so happy to be here. Thank you so much. Um, we have a lot to talk about. We were connecting before we sat down. There's so much that we could say in this conversation, um, but we're also committed to respecting everybody's time today. So without much more further ado, we're going to dive in. Um, we'll start out by doing introductions. Um, we'll share our names, pronouns, um, a brief visual description of ourselves, um, and the institutions that we represent. So good morning. <laughs> My name is Talia Corin. I am the co-executive director here at Art New York. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a white woman with light brown curly hair, green eyes, and I'm wearing a black and red floral blouse. Um, passing it down. Good morning. Um, I'm Chelsea Smith. I'm a program officer at the Altman Foundation. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I am a Puerto Rican woman um, wearing white colors and red accessories. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephanie Ibarra. I am seven and a half months old as the program officer <laughs> at the Mellon Foundation. Um, and I am a, a Mexican-American woman. I use she and her pronouns. I have dark curly hair in a top knot with a multicolored headband and a denim dress on. Hi, I'm Rebecca Hewitt, she, her pronouns. I'm the program uh, director at the Schubert Foundation. I'm a white woman, long, dark brown hair, brown tortoise shell glasses, wearing a black blouse with pink and white flowers on it. Thanks very much, Talia. Great. Um, I forgot to ask the other important question that I wanted to do as part of intros, which is something that you've seen recently that you loved or can't stop thinking about. Thanks so much for asking, David. No problem. Um, great. So anybody want to kick us off with a, something that you've seen recently that you can't stop thinking about or are thrilled exists? Maybe we can go I'll reverse go, order. Sure. Reverse Rebecca, order. Kick us off. I saw Nikki Douglas's piece, Pray. Uh, it's a co-pro mm -hmm. with Ars Nova and National Black Theater. I saw it on Friday night, and I've been thinking about nothing else since. It's a beautiful reimagining of what church could, might, look like and it's just gorgeous and it closes on the 28th so you still have a few days to see it. I uh, so right before I came back to New York I was the artistic director at Baltimore Center Stage and I was back there 
this weekend for the inaugural uh, Locally Grown Festival, which is a festival yeah. of all manner of performance um, by local artists. And y'all, I, it, I was weeping um, <laughs> from everything from like the puppetry to the ballroom battle um, mm -hmm. that was packed. And uh, it, was, it was just glorious and gave me so much hope. Uh, my pick is Infinite Life, Annie Baker's Infinite Life mm. at the Atlantic Theater Company, which uh, was awesome. I'm sorry yeah. it's, it's not open anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a good reminder to see shows when they're open, yeah. right? Yeah. Buy tickets, <laughs> buy tickets. Okay. Um, I'm going to say two. Yeah. Um, so uh, the first one was Jazz uh, Athens and Brightening, mm. which was absolutely amazing. Um, Everyone had a chance to see it. Um, it was just, it was just riveting, and um, and the audience, you could hear pin drop. It was just spectacular. Um, and then uh, over the weekend, I was lucky enough to go to the Met uh, to see New York City Children's Theater Corea uh, Abuelita uh, run, um, which was for their youngest theater goers. Um, and it was in such a beautiful space in the Asian art uh, section. And um, to see the, the little ones like so engaged by what was in front of the, the sort of like enormous pieces of art. And then this very like small, intimate, and accessible uh, work was really fantastic. Beautiful. Um, I haven't been to the theater recently, which I'm ashamed to admit to this audience. So I will say I, um, I saw a beautiful summer live DJs and dance performances all over the city. Yeah. Uh, particular shout out to Natasha Diggs and the Dances Life community and the Mellon Foundation for funding uh, the resurgence of disco and muscle and the queer community that supports it in New York City. I love that. We can be multi-genre here. We're not <laughs> limited to just theater. I feel like all, all appreciation is great. Um, there's so much that I've loved recently, and there's so many things that I'm excited to see this fall. Um, I was lucky enough to be at the he uh, We Are Here opening at The Shed on Sunday, which was very cool. Um, just amazing to see the work that Sondheim was doing at the end of his life and the embrace of absurdity in theater, um, especially in these absurd times. I was like, yes, we are. <laughs> that feels true. Um, and so I, I love the strangeness. Love the strangeness. Um, so one thing that I'm curious about, because I feel like one of the whole purposes of this panel is um, to like open up the dialogue. Uh, you all are like rich and interesting and curious people, um, as evidenced both by your taste and also the work that you've chosen to do. But I also know that many of you have your own creative artistic practices, um, either that is avocational or, <laughs> or otherwise in your current roles. And I'm wondering if you would share about that and how you feel that it informs your approach to grant making um, and the funding lens for anybody who wants to get I can start. Um, I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd call it a creative practice, but as a, I grew up in a military family, so I grew up moving around every couple of years like clockwork. And what I always glommed onto wherever I lived, and whenever I lived in a new place, was what what kind of artistic outlet could I mm. find there? Theater was the place where I found a lot of acceptance as a kid bouncing around, especially when you got to like those really awkward, wonderful early tween years. Damn. Yeah. So for me, that's, that's why I love what I do, that we get to, Schubert, as a national funder, we fund theater and dance in every nook and cranny, almost every nook and cranny of the country. And that's, so that's why I do what I do, to, to, to believe that, I'm, that we are helping other people find that creative outlet is a big deal to me. And that's how I, that's how I get going in the morning when I'm on the subway. I used to be an actor. And that's why I entered my career. And um, I haven't been on stage. Um, I think the last time I was on stage was a stage reading in 2017. Um, but I, I'll never forget when I, a million years ago, when I worked at the Playwrights Realm, I used my professional development funds as the producing director to take a, um, a Greek devising uh, workshop with Anne Bogart. Wow. And, um, and, it, and it was for the express purpose of not 
losing or, or continuing to remember not just what it meant to create and to activate that part of myself, but also to um, continue to retain the empathy for what it means for those who are creating and the vulnerability um, that is required um, of, the, of the creative space. And so um, I don't know what that will look like in my new life um, working for the Mellon Foundation, but I do think that continuing to go back and like touch that part, that the generative artist part mm. um, feels important to uh, empathy. Yeah, yeah, practicing vulnerability is good for all of us. Yeah, yeah. anybody else wanna share about creative expression? Uh, well, I'm an actor too. I have a BFA from Syracuse, so I spent about 10 years uh, pursuing that. Don't ask me what I was in. Lots and lots, <laughs> and lots of equity showcases. Um, so I have that, you know, context. Um, my husband and I at the time also started a small theater company, a 501c3, so I have that context. Um, so I feel like as a grant maker, that's just the greatest because it gives me a shorthand. I know what all these words mean. I know what a 29 hour reading is. We can have a much more nuanced, um, richer conversation because I'm not, you know, I've, I've, I've done that. I've done yeah. Yeah. I do feel like there is so much like lingo. Hmm. Both in the funder space, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of lingo in philanthropy, and there's also so much lingo in the, you know, creative practice. And I feel like sometimes one of the challenges can be those like miscommunications or people feeling like they have to translate something that mm -hmm. that perhaps it would just be better to say like no we should just have the shared vocabulary mm -hmm. like, is that something that you feel um creates kind of either opportunities or obstacles that come up mm -hmm. this was a non-script <laughs> <laughs> well then there would be no pop quizzes and i i'll take that question <laughs> Um, so I've never been an actor or a dancer. <laughs> <Bless> <laughs> um, and so I feel like I've always sort of been in the support cheerleader listener kind of uh, kind of role my my entire career. Um, and my background is in dramatic literature and writing. Um, and so I, I do approach uh, sort of new work and, and kind of this endless curiosity with um, artists creating. I think there's also the, the, the flip side of the sort of camaraderie uh, around a shared vocabulary means that at least um, at the Mellon Foundation, as we are um, wading ever deeper into uh, social justice and what it means to be a social justice um, funder, that uses or that leverages the arts for change. Um, I think that much to some folks' chagrin, like the, the Mellon Arts and Culture team is stacked with dip practitioners from different disciplines, which mm -hmm. means also that it is very um, hard to hide. They're like, there's nowhere to hide in terms mm -hmm. of the analysis around um, what the justice practices are, what the equitable practices are, and if an organ assessing if an organization is um, at, at a diversity place, or if they're, or if they've moved along the continuum into a liberatory space, um, and, and any space in between. So I think it can cut both ways too, because there's, there's with such a deep knowledge of what the work is, it means that um, that that we can we can have more hopefully realistic conversation about. Yeah. And before we got started, just a moment ago, Tully and then Amy and I were talking about how grateful we were to have had this conversation. The Art New York has, has brought us all in the room together because so many of the funder conversations happen one-on-one -on -one with individual grantees. And I think there's a lot of, I think, telephone that kind of can kind of come out of that. As I heard that 
Mellon's doing this, and I heard that mm -hmm. Schubert's doing that. And so to be all together here and, and have this conversation feels really timely. And I want to thank Art New York for putting this together. Thank you. And thank you all for being mm -hmm. here. It feels like um, this is like a dream day and the scariest day <laughs> um, to be able to like have these conversations. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Stephanie, you bringing up the sort of like, as we integrate practices, right? As we both bring like a discipline focused approach, but also these other lenses of equity, social justice. I think that there are really interesting conversations both in our field and I think also just like broader cultural conversations about how we navigate or, or find balance or not find balance um, around approaches that are justice centered or social justice focused, but also really about um, rigorous art making in various ways. And as funders, what do you think that looks like? Or what do you think the changes are in how that looks? Um, because I think there has been a lot of change. And I think this is a good example, Rebecca, of like the grapevine is perhaps not reflective of where any individual funding institution is or any particular theater maker is. And so I'm interested to hear if there are, if you have observations about either the conversations that you're having in family with your boards and, and um, teams or what you're hearing from um, grantees and theater makers about like where that conversation is moving. majority of our arts and culture focus is on youth development, um, so mostly funding for the kids for young people and their access to the arts, as well as what we call arts infrastructure grants, which is where our New York are focused on assistance level investments that you know, impact multiple artists by their, their one appreciation and importance of art in all forms um, for accessing you know, sort of these universal truths and offering an outlet um, you know, for the things that don't make any sense and that we want to sort of rage against and explain. So um, supporting the organizations that have been doing good work all this, this time um, to give them what they need to be able to take that back and expand it. Yeah. So to reflect back, it sounds like that your approach at Altman is really kind of responding to and supporting what the community tells you it wants or needs or that the artist tells you like yeah. this is the direction that we're trying to push absolutely with integrity yeah. and good judgment yes <laughs> asterisk asterisk <laughs> just doing whatever <laughs> um, anybody else want to sort of add to that question i can jump in i think if i'm if i'm understanding the question correctly and i, I think i'm piggybacking a little bit on what you said, where we want to be responsive to the goals and desires and hopes and dreams of each individual organization that we fund. Um, and I think it's the organization's responsibility, including all of the foundation's responsibilities you know, and the theater companies, to really examine what their mission is in a very deep and full way. Everybody has a mission, um, but how, how much have you unpacked what that mission really means and developed goals around that mission? So I like to hear, you know, what, 
how self-aware is an organization? Mm -hmm. Again, including all of ours, how mm -hmm. self-aware are we in what we're really doing to actualize that mission? So yeah. I, that is something I really like to dig into with people, because you yeah. can say, I'm trying to do this and this and this, but are, are you really? And it's OK whatever the mission is. Mm -hmm. But have it and stick to it, and let's see where that goes. Mm -hmm. So it's both the sort of like um, individual acknowledgement or awareness of like, this is the role that we serve in our community. And our community is defined in this way. And the, the services that we're looking to provide are these. And we can have a real conversation about where we either need additional support for that, where we aren't meeting the demands of our community, or where maybe we say like, is that needed? Mm -hmm. um, which I think is like an interesting um, Sort of like super mission focused way of approaching it. I think that kind of transparency mm -hmm. is what we're thinking and talking about a lot at Schubert too. And I feel like there are lots of things that maybe grantees are afraid to tell funders because of what it might look like. Mm. But for us to do our jobs, we need to know what's going on. And I know that's it's easy for us to say that because we're the funders. It's easy yeah. for us to say that, mm -hmm. and it comes from a place of privilege to be able to say that. But like it really and truly to be here for the field, we need to know the truth of what's happening. So. This is why I think discussions like this are so wonderfully helpful. In terms of what we're talking about at Schubert, we've begun having application seminars. Mm -hmm. Our next one is on November 8th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> you can sign up on our website. Mm -hmm. um, but it's for people who haven't been funded by Schubert yet. But it's mm -hmm. also designed for new staff members at existing grantees. There's been mm -hmm. so much turnover, and we see that, and we know that. So the questions we're getting from people it, 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 we, it became clear to us that there were a lot of people doing this application for the first time, mm. or were doing it very recently, you know, had not had much experience with it. So that's how we're trying to meet that moment by hopefully offering greater transparency about our process and how we do what we do. Mm. But there are always going to be other, like more that we can do. And that's where this kind of conversation can be so helpful in giving us a sense of how to do that better and better. Absolutely, and just building on that. Great, but um, we, you know, we pride ourselves on having an open door policy. We're not invitation only, but that open door is also about communication and about that very, um, you know, we want to hear from you. We want to know the issues facing the field, the issues facing just your feeder in particular. Um, we want to give you the space for it, however you're comfortable. But we know that sometimes it is intimidating. Um, and so a, a group like this, hopefully, um, you know, can make you feel more secure <laughs> in, in just kind of sharing things and, and kind of making um, one of the greatest things that has, has happened post-COVID is the breaking down of silos. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more that, that we can help do that and, and build these partnerships um, is, uh, is the utmost important. I think I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about what you were sort of alluding to, Rebecca, of like, maybe people don't know how to answer the questions, or I think especially around issues or um, challenges that organizations are facing around whether it's programming capacity, whether it's staff retention, mm -hmm. whether, it's, um, whether it is uh, around you know, equity or justice work. Like, I think that there is so much fear mm -hmm. around either how people are perceived or um, imagining that there are these kind of like benchmarks that you all have set that you aren't telling anybody <laughs> or like, you know, secret metrics that exist somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if um, you all would talk a little bit about like, what you wish people were telling you more about or like questions that you have. Or, or conversations that you want to be having with grantees that feel um, either like it's difficult to get a kind of fulsome answer or that it just feels like there's not, um, maybe there's more trust that we can build and we can build around like sharing and giving visibility. I'm thinking about what Emily said around self-awareness. Again, I'm thinking about um, whether we're talking about organizational capacity, mission, or again, in the case of the, the sort of Mellon rubric, how we assess um, justice-oriented practices. I think that kind of self-awareness um, of, of what the internal challenges are is 
it's demonstrative of a, a, a critical lens, being able mm. to bring a, I don't mean critical bad, I mean critical, mm -hmm. an, like an analysis mm -hmm. right. to the organization. So there is, at least from where I sit, that ability to say, yeah, these are, these are pain points. And, and this is how it connects to the larger system of, the larger theater ecosystem and the larger sort of shenanigans in the systems that oppress us all. You know, being, having that kind of analysis is really, um, it, 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 it brings a, a sort of new opportunity, I think, to the partnership. Um, because now we are we're speaking a common language about what we together want to tackle. Mm -hmm. um, and it starts to, at least in my experience, my seven months experience, <laughs> it starts to disrupt or starts to chip away at the power dynamics because we can come together and say, we are both looking at this set of problems. Right. And they're very real. And let us be authentic and vulnerable about it. And then also, I think it's incumbent on us as grant makers to be transparent about what we can and can't help with, yeah. you yeah. know, whether that's financial support or, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I feel fortunate to have been able to work with all of you as funders for your, your organizations, and I do feel like that approach of, like, partnership, of, like, let's look at the problem together, right? We're not in an adversarial, we're definitely not in an adversarial relationship, and we're not really even in an evaluative relationship. Mm -hmm. How can we be in a sort of like, we're both looking at the same set of circumstances that what if there were different variables, right? Like what, are, what can we identify together um, to think about a new way? Um, and I do feel like one of the things that is great about this panel, and you've already sort of illuminated it, is that there are so many different approaches to grant making. Each of these funders have a, a sort of lens, whether it's a geographical focus, um, a different way of approaching, kind of identifying how you function, and you're all in conversation with each other. Um, and so I wonder if you can just sort of reflect on like, what does it look like to be, I think we talk a lot as a field about the relationship between different producing organizations or presenting organizations and this sort of ecosystem of the way the projects move. Um, but I think the same thing happens in philanthropy and this sort of like ecosystem and approaches to grant making that are layered, you know, you sort of dovetail in interesting ways. Um, what do you think that, you know, what are your sort of reflections on that or how does that, uh, I think, influence the way that maybe a grantee positions their work? Well, I think we're always looking for the biggest bang for our buck. So how can our dollars yeah. go as far as possible? And if that means collaborating in certain ways, then that, that is like the most exciting part of grant making, truly. Um, we do talk to one another. We have opportunities where we meet and work together. We have service organizations for arts philanthropy that we all belong to. So we're, we're very connected. And there have been many examples um, during my time at Gilman where we've collaborated with funders very, very deliberately on a very specific project where uh, you know, one funder might be able to fund some capacity building support, another funder might be able to come in with some debt relief, another funder might be able right. to come with, in with some general operating support. And we've worked that very specifically to you know, help an organization get to the next place it wants to be. Yep. Um, so I think the more of that we can do the better and and I do want to just underscore that behind the scenes like we are always trying to find the next bit of leverage oh I can't mm. fund that company they don't fit within my guidelines let me call my friend at this organization and let them know this is an amazing organization or if I give this grant I know I could leverage over here to unlock this money that is a that you know that's part of our job so we're doing that and if I was, yeah go ahead if I could also put Emily on the spot a little bit more, Emily leads a really great committee at the New York Great Makers in the Arts, and it's about it's called the Common Application Committee. And I don't want to get anyone's hopes up because I think the Common Application <laughs> in New York is not going to happen for lots of reasons, and I'm very sorry. So I don't want to give anyone false hope. But what that what that what that committee has evolved into under Emily's excellent leadership is also really interesting. So can I put you on the spot? This might be a panel no no, and I'm sorry. 
it's about that committee oh, yes. and the great, the great work it. that we're doing there. Love it, love it. Uh, so yes, Rebecca is on the committee. <laughs> um, and uh, Dylan over from the uh, DTLA. So it's been great. We, um, we meet once a month and we talk about what are the pain points for folks applying for grants, for arts grants, uh, whether they be individuals or organizations applying for New York City. Um, funding so you know it takes a lot of time and it's it produces a lot of anxiety so are there ways as a funding community we can alleviate some of that so um, you know are we all asking a question about um, tell me about the history of your organization but we're asking it in 15 different ways yeah. and that's mm -hmm. creating a lot of anxiety about how to answer it for each individual mm -hmm. funder Maybe there's ways to come together on something like that. Something Gilman put in its um, application for 2024, it's tiny, but I think it's significant, is um, in the budget requirement section, we just put a little note that said, if you wanna submit uh, you know, the template you used for your DCLA grant for your budget, please just send us that. So just you know, a little acknowledgement that we are working together and, and we, we want to simplify things. And if I, yeah, and Gilman and Schubert have been talking too about, we have such an overlap of grantees. Mm. We're a national funder, they're not, so there's, there's not gonna be a, there's not gonna be a common application, and I'm very sorry. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like, where can, like, where is there enough overlap? Like, what are those, like, the supplemental materials we're asking for? Can, like, like, there's a lot in common that we can try and come together on. So we're talking, that's one of the biggest things that we're talking about together right now. Mm -hmm. I'm also interested in, you know, Chelsea, you spoke a little bit about the Altman portfolio, the relationship between general operating support, capacity building, um, project specific funding. Do you all feel like there are certain trends that you want to see more of? You know, obviously, I think, Emily, I think you did a beautiful job. Pieces all fit together, right? Like in an ideal world, no nothing is happening in a vacuum, and mm -hmm. both for good reasons, um, and also because I think it builds great coalitions in the way that you were talking about. Not every funder can fund everything. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that is like a true <laughs> reality um, today. And um, but I wonder, like, what you're seeing on sort of the trend level of how general operating support, project funding, capacity building. And other sort of you know specialty lines definitely for lines of credit or other ways of providing financial support to organizations. Do you observe any kind of like macro trends about those kinds of support? I think specifically in New York City, um, arts funding. or gaps that you wish somebody could fill that you can't? You know, things that you're like, I would love somebody to be funding something. I'm sitting next to you. Very nice. <laughs> you respond. Um, you know, I, I think the trend that I'm observing is more on what is being um, asked for, and so I can't really speak necessarily to whether we as a field or as a sector are responding in that yet. Right, but we hear these calls very much for general operating support for um, for longer, you know, um, you know, multi-year grants like three, if not even for the foundation, we think a ten-year grant. It's like wow, that is That's amazing. amazing. Um, we're not there, right? Um, and so you know, sort of this move towards what ultimately falls under sort of trust. It's philanthropy. Um, you know, and then also the nuances of what that really looks like when we are looking for leverage when we have trustees to sort of report back to um, that new materials. But we had a you know call for phone calls or no reporting, and then you're sort of like, well, where is the shared language? Where's the shared sort of material from this experience that we can then go and keep translating? So I think um, there's this call for just more money to flow more seamlessly, quickly, and with fewer restrictions. And I think there's definitely um, you know, enthusiasm to move in that direction. And we're all to the point of the common application trying to navigate um, you know, how close we can get towards that dream within, you know, and barriers we can break down, et cetera, within our own organizations. Yeah, I think um, I'll just underscore the trust-based philanthropy mm -hmm. as like a phrase that I think is, is one that in my understanding of it, both has like very sort of like structural implications, but I think also 
can be like a way of being, right? You know, it can be a posture even if if there are um, structures that we have not fully dismantled, in part because there are um, other like big bets to make potentially. Um, and so I think that's a really great that's a really great lens. I'm thinking about. Um... It, it's a, I, I, like Chelsea. I can't really speak to trends across philanthropy. However, um, I am hearing more and more across. So I steward the performing arts portfolio um, for Mellon. So it's not just theater. It's across dance and music and everything in between. And as organizations um, of at scale, not all scales, but particularly at the larger scale, as they are trying to correct course right size, reimagine. Some people might call it contracting, scaling back, right? Like um, uh, what I hear is, and I, this gets back to like, how are we creating the conditions for grantees or potential grantees to really come with their whole authentic problems <laughs> and, and potential solutions? Um, because uh, increasingly, I'm just real talk hearing organizations be straight up punished from, from um, funders, don't individual corporate, you know, your budget got smaller, you are not doing as many shows, as many this, as many, the product, mm. the productive, the sort of Henry Ford assembly line, like um, rat race, that has become, has been so standard for so long right. that now as organizations really try to like do right by their artists, their people, their capacity, and their and and right size their activity to their resources. Mm. It we're in a place where um, there are funders and donors who who see that as a sign of I don't know fail your failure. Mm. I have no idea, mm. but that is um, increasingly I'm having those conversations, and so that's a very worrying trend. Mm -hmm. um, and and I feel very fortunate to be in a at a foundation that can um, that can hold the the um, the risk portfolio that it, or the the corrective nature of this moment and lean in where other funders are straight up getting out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do feel like there there were snaps in the room just <laughs> in case they didn't fully translate um, onto the video. I think that you know that idea feels. A, it's so connected to this sort of like people not wanting to share their full selves, mm -hmm. you know, because um, there's this sort of like fear of a punitive response. And I think that it really gets to the heart of, Emily, what you were saying about like really understanding mission. And I think that mm -hmm. as art makers, um, as people who have specifically chosen the practice of doing a like temporal, ephemeral, <laughs> highly collaborative, requiring many people with many specialized skill sets that do a particular thing, and then it goes away. Um, we had never been in an economy of scale, right? Like, that's not the nature of, of our creative work. And yet, um, I think that perhaps in times of other either economic conditions or um, other just sort of like moments in time, there was this sort of like more, 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 like we'll just do more shows and bigger shows and more theaters and more companies and um, and that that there is like an unsustainability built into that sort of pull to sort of be like, oh yes, my budget gets bigger every year. We hire more people every year. And that if we release that, if we are able to release that to find like a more art-based, you know, and human-based way of making with each other, um, it does put a lot of pressure on sort of like the structures that we've set up, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I was just serving on a, a NISCA grant panel um, that was like beautifully run and executed. And, you know, and I know Dylan is here, not to be on the side again. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when you're working with public funds, there's also a different pressure, right? Mm -hmm. There are different outputs that are around public good, you know, public access, public um, ability for for citizens to participate in art, which is yet a different lens. And so I do feel like I understand without even having been a part of it, the challenges of the common application of like, sometimes we're actually after different things and that wants to be okay too. Um, but how can we do that without downsizing giving 
at the exact moment that organizations are trying to make really smart choices mm -hmm. about how they move through like a generative practice at a time that is really hard, mm -hmm. expensive, and mm -hmm. demanding. Mm -hmm. I think it also gets to how we learn from you all so that we can advocate better for you to who we report to, mm -hmm. and our boards of directors as well, who may not have a background in theater or, or nonprofit theater. So again, like that, that, that stress of being honest about how you're scaling your work as you come out of the pandemic, again, it's easy for us to say that, but at the same time, knowing more helps us advocate to the people that we report to and helps them understand why we're making the recommendations that we feel like we need to make in light of what we've learned from how you're handling these situations on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. I think remember that these people are your advocates yeah. and <laughs> friends. They want to go to bat for you to get better at what you um, and I, I think that that underscores like the need for sort of really candid and trusting conversations. Well, just to give props to Rebecca, who really was the driving force on our webinar. Um, we already had one, we're having a, a second, as was mentioned. And the fav my favorite from the anonymous survey, because we don't have to, <laughs> uh, no one was put on the spot, is that um, what really came through is how much we want uh, our grantees or potential grantees to succeed. Mm -hmm. And we do. I mean, we're lucky enough to have increased funding year over year and to add new groups year over year. We don't, you know, just keep the same group. And so we want to know, you know, we sustain, but we also, you know, grow. And, yeah. yeah, this is, um, this is now a question that I prepared that feels very much like a talk back question where you're like, it's a monologue. Is there a question at the end? <laughs> I will do my best. Um, so I think like thinking about this topic of both like, what are the needs of this field right now? How do we bring all of the varied approaches that each of you bring and then the field at large to this moment of real uncertainty? And I feel like, you know, we lived through a summer of op-eds and hot takes on like all kinds of ideas. And one, sort of recurring theme was this um, kind of uh, call to fund individual artists over institutions. And I feel like Stephanie, you posted on Facebook a widely circulated post that was calling out sort of the fallacy at the heart of that, which is artists are institutions. And they run and power our organizations, whether it is people who have a directing practice and write grants on the side, or whether it's the technicians and dramaturgs and producers who staff organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also feel like there's the, the sort of thread that is the acknowledgement that I think has been super clear today that our field is so porous. You know, artists and audiences and administrators like move across institutions. So nothing is ever one thing. You know, I feel like looking into this room, I know so many of you with four different hats, you know, um, and I think that that is a strength. And so I feel like there's this sort of, um, oh, the, <laughs> the, uh, the sort of artist versus the institution, which I think is, is false. But then I think also just sort of the like, well, renewed support versus expanding your portfolio, or sort of all of these kind of dichotomies that are, I think, in large part not real, but I think end up kind of having these like very tense pulls. Um, and I wonder, you know, obviously, I think that if you all each had access to an unlimited ATM machine, you would just distribute as much as you can as quickly as you can. But recognizing that there are limitations and there do have to be hard decisions, how do you think about this kind of like funding an ecosystem as opposed to perhaps an individual idea or an individual outcome? What does it look like to kind of take on the bigness of an ecosystem? That's a constant question at Schubert because we are a national funder, because we do fund companies with really small budgets of $150,000 um, up to you know tens and tens of millions. So it, for us, this tension of wanting to keep 
working with supporting the companies we have for decades versus also bringing on new companies every year that's our constant it's, it's our constant conversation and there's no there's no easy or straightforward answer i think unfortunately i mean every funder has to make a choice about depth versus breadth mm -hmm. so in, in as as much money as 38 million dollars is it's still a finite resource so there still comes a point where we have to talk about how much can that money do this year so it's it's a it's a constant tension of wanting to support the theater ecosystem nationwide. I mean, ours is organization based. You have to have a 501c3. We can't. We don't even fund fiscally sponsored companies. So that's that's not. I mean, just to, that's not going to change. So it's it, we do believe and hope that our organizational grantees are using that money. We hope we hope it's underwriting a certain amount of risk taking with the artists that they are that they are supporting. But that's. Yeah. It's a, it's a constant discussion of how, you know, do we raise, where can we raise, where can we add, where, it's, it's, a, it's hard to get your arms around it. Um, that's not, you know, a precise answer, but yes, that is true. <laughs> it's just a vast scale mm -hmm. um, to be working on. And I think, you know, I, I'm very curious to hear everybody else's thoughts on this topic, but I, I, one of the conversations that has bubbled up a few times at Art New York recently is like, one of the things that's challenging about theater is that as organizations grow, which is not a great organization's desire, which is also great, but that organizations at different sizes and different phases in their life cycle, it's not just a difference in scale, it's like a difference in kind. You know, the, the ways of taking risk, the ways of absorbing risk, the ways of like, um, providing really longitudinal support for artists versus like deep investment. You know, it's the same. There are so many ways to parse what an organization needs, some of which are not even reflected in a budget, but also there is so much variety within that. Um, it's a huge portfolio to hold. I really appreciate the question around ecosystem. It is, um, it's a big part of um, how, how uh, Mellon lured me away from this vocation. Um, <laughs> but, but thinking about it, uh, not just the theater ecosystem, but in, in my portfolio, the, the performing arts. Yeah. And the good news is, I guess, the good news is that across artistic practices, individual artists and organizations are experiencing such similar things. It's just not unique to theater. Right. Um, but that question of like, how do you analyze an ecosystem and, um, and then, you know, not to get super scientific about it, but then identify the sort of indicator species that that if you sort if you go in and you and you really focus on this aspect of the ecosystem, it is truly going to be the most impactful lever that you can push. That that feels like um, a very like a moving target, at least from where I sit right now. I I could not tell you as even with the theater ecosystem, which I spent literally my entire career in, I couldn't say if you push this one lever, it will unlock everything else. It's got it's got to be multiple. Levers, and I think to your point about the like individual artist versus the institution and the versus the binary embedded in that, um, I reject it wholly, completely, um, on Facebook and in real life. <laughs> <laughs> and the power structures that have been built up over generations privilege um, the like the physical embodiment of these like institutions and their their structures, their, their memories, their rigidity, their values. And so what does it mean to embolden, enable, and enable artists to challenge that, really? Um, like that feels like a more specific question. And the, and the last thing I'll say in my own talkback monologue mm. is that I, I want to, you, you just said it, Talia, and I hear it over and over again that like, the institutions don't want to grow, like not, not everybody wants to grow. And I just want to get a little bit no, more nuanced about that because if, if you believe in um, the theory of cost disease, and if you believe in compensation and, and thriving wages, and you believe that inflation is going where it's going, if you believe that costs are going to continue to do this, then you must grow. Right. You must. It, it doesn't mean the scale at which you're operating needs to expand. But in terms of the cost the, that you are actually like 
paying out, you must grow. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to like bring a little bit of like nuance into that. We don't want to grow. We're so small. We're going to stay small. Mm -hmm. False. If you want to keep pace and it, with, with all of the values, you are going to have to put more resources because we live in a capitalist blah, 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 blah. And also, can we, I, yes. And also, I feel like a lot of companies are handling that by not growing, maybe necessarily with dollars, but with resource sharing. Yes. So, yeah. so yes. like for example, I was I was in Buffalo doing site visits last month, and they've got this great program every fall called Curtain Up, where a lot of their theater companies open shows around the same week in September, and it gets a huge amount of publicity for all the companies around the entire city. It was all over the local news. They had a block party downtown. It was all people you know in town were talking about that week was going to see live theater. Um, the Frederick Foundation in Connecticut is funding a bunch of our Connecticut-based grantees to, with a grant to think about how they can better resource share in this moment. Seema Sueco, the amazing human mm -hmm. director, uh, human being extraordinaire, um, won the Alan Schneider Award from TCG last year, maybe the year before, and she's using part of her proceeds to put together virtual learning circles about uh, solidarity economies. Mm -hmm. So how can we as theater artists not rely on money to do this, to do to to meet this moment of expansion. So I think all the those are just my it's my this is my <laughs> monologue talk back. Yeah. Um, but but I, I would also say that in terms of how the expansion is happening, there are ways in which it's happening outside of financial exchange. Amen. Mm -hmm. I mean, this picks up a little bit on what we were talking about in the last session, which was yeah. about. Staff retention, HR, people, people who work at these organizations, and talking a little bit about how do theater companies come together and share one HR department. And I mean, I know that like these ideas come in cycles, and they kind of every few decades they go like this. But now is the time, and you know, with service organizations like Art New York leading these conversations, the more I think we can explore these kinds of shared situations, the better. We talked about Pittsburgh in our last session as well, and their shared artistic services, which are exceptional. I know New York is different, and it's bigger. I know we can't do it, but like maybe we could do it. Um, and I think we don't talk about it. Right. So, you know, I think that I certainly, I'm sure all of us are seeing much more partnership than ever before amongst theater companies yeah. post-pandemic. Many more co-productions, which is, I think so fantastic, yeah. and I think theaters have to to resist the um, temptation to tear each other down if they are different shapes and different sizes and do different types of work. And oh, I'm a I'm a big theater, so I wouldn't want to work with the little theater, or I'm a little theater, so I'm doing real art, and the big theater is not doing real art. Like yeah. that has got to go, yeah. um, because I think we have an opportunity to work together much more right now. And there's and there are real, but there and just to say the for us as grant makers too, there are actual real impediments to um, the kind of collaboration I think we would all see. And I think that that sort of big budget, little budget is a great example of um, here in New York and across the country, like. The way that the, the mental and producing gymnastics that me and my colleagues have had to do to sequence a co-production in order to adhere to the, the, uh, the collective bargaining clause that says you cannot take a pay cut, you know, there, there, are, there are things that are in place for good reason, but they prohibit the kind of um, just like free-flowing collaborative experimentation and a lot of those a lot of those things look like you know regular regular calendars but a lot of it looks like you know cbas and agreements across different unions that that impact and inform um a theater's ability to to partner and to force multiply mm -hmm. and to share resources it also strikes me that um you know when we think about resource sharing um, beyond co-productions, which I think have their own sort of like set of uh, unique hoops. Um, but I think that there are really interesting ways of, of kind of parsing the idea of like shared HR mm -hmm. 
maybe putting it through the same filter as like the common application conversation of like, how do we recognize what is shared mm -hmm. and how do we recognize what are unique needs across a different organization mm -hmm. and build a container that is both like flexible enough, but also supportive enough that it does a thing, mm -hmm. um, which I think is not, I think it is, that is the kind of creativity that I think we're all being kind of called on right now mm -hmm. to exercise because there's not sort of a like, oh, copy paste that, we've done it. Um, and I do think that, uh, but I think you're right, Emily, like it's time again, you know, <laughs> if these are yeah. kind of circular conversations, um, the cycle is like back to, to needing to think about if we're not going to just continue on like the rat race of meeting and beating inflation, and trying to pay people better um, and absent of you know universal basic income and um, socialized medicine in this country like there are you know there are like inescapable big forces and so if we want to as a sector be released from some of that pressure it is about finding those kind of like what is the non-financial way of building that structure mm -hmm. so uh, i'll weigh in um, I'm on the Safety Net Coalition of Grant yes. Makers and Arts. Um, we so, that too. <laughs> <laughs> a little more lofty in our goals. Um, you know, it's really interesting though because it's really the fundamentals of these these sort of these bigger systemic things, right? Like, why can't we have access to universal health care? What what does it look like to have a solidarity economy? And where is there common cause for coalition building efforts outside of the theater, outside of the arts, with other human beings in society who are struggling with these same issues to meet their basic needs, let alone find affordable space, <laughs> coordinate the schedule to get everyone there, afford the union labor to hire the set, you know, and do the whole thing, right? And so I think building um, critical consciousness around the, um, you know, just conditions of our lived experience is really valuable and finding shared, um, you know, shared, shared, Sure, fellow travelers, <laughs> um, you know, to, to walk that road together is, is, is really just of increasing importance um, because we end up with exactly, you know, exactly what you're describing, right? It's, it's shared back office if it's HR or if you go to Arts Pool for your financial management, et cetera, and then an Arts Pool comes to us, right? Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, but visioning that forward, right? And so being able to have at least um, the network effect of, um, you know, collaborative thinking, collaborative dreaming, collaborative identification of what the barriers are so that you can begin to kind of solve for them, I think is really valuable. So things like this are the first step, um, you know, to getting outside of your particular theater or your particular issue yeah. and looking up and saying, okay, well, maybe the solution might be in the room or at least mm -hmm. my fellow traveler to get there. Yeah, I think that's such a great point. I think I'm, you know, you all know, but in a previous life, I was a development consultant and spent a lot of time thinking about um, fundraising. And I feel like one of the things that I would like rail against quietly to myself um, was that I think we often ask philanthropy, private philanthropy specifically, to solve structural problems that are not private philanthropies. For me, you know, that there's often this sort of like, the, all of the issues of the safety net coalition and this sort of like, what are we called on to provide each other? You know, how do we, how do we make it possible to make art, you know, around things like housing and, you know, all of those other sort of basic needs. And I think that sometimes it's a real, um, I found at least that I could kind of like work myself into a whole spiral of being like, but who's doing it? Um, and I think that that is like, a, I think it's something that I appreciate how all of you are talking about this because there is both agency around like how can we think structurally, find fellow travelers, build coalitions in interesting ways, but also we all kind of have to work in the lane and the and the role that we have and um, and I think that that's like a good thing to sort of demystify of. Um, uh, I want I want to say like. Philanthropy is not the man, but also, <laughs> you know, but also like there are all of these like structures that make it difficult to function in certain ways. And I think, you know, kind of recognizing 
um, that that the idealism of art practices butts up against the realities of our absurd room um, that we're in, and I think that that can be that can be tough, and I think does also feed into some of the potentially adversarial feelings between you know, grantees or applicants and those working in philanthropy. But also philanthropy is very much the man. Like, <laughs> real talk. Look where the money comes from. Ill-gotten gains across the board, yeah? <laughs> yes, also that. Um, what the new normal is. And I think part of that is like we all have to perhaps breathe into the possibility that there is no new normal and normal is not mm. here for us. <laughs> but I think um, there are trends and there are sort of like patterns. I wonder if you can kind of help contextualize like what do you see, you know, I think people have talked a little bit about like contraction, co-pros, um, any other kind of like programmatic trends or, oh, also um, change, change uh, leadership change and staff change. Um, those I think are like definitely trends that we can all acknowledge are affecting a lot of folks. Um, are there any other kind of like macro trends that we haven't talked about or things that you have a sense might be coming? I, I um, feel really excited by the organizations who are taking um, an incredibly expansive view to the definition of theater. Mm -hmm. um, the organizations who are, uh, I know this is blasphemous, but like jettisoning their main stage seasons. Um, and even that idea of that language around yeah. normal um, uh, puts us in, a, again, a binary of what is normalized and what is abnormal. And increasingly I hear the language is like, um, shout out to Annalisa Diaz in her essay in Rescripted um, around uh, decomposition, uh, not collapse. Yeah. Dear theater be like soil, that thing. Um, we need all the ideas all the time. Chain, and this is Octavia Butler, um, change is God, God is change, right? And so if, the, if we normalize dynamism and change, constant, change, then I think we we relieve ourselves of trying to get to a fixed destination or a monolithic or homogenization of, of a model. Yeah. And if we can embrace all the ways of practicing, I think that that is, in, I, I am hearing that language increasingly and it makes me so happy. What do you think that looks like practically? Like, do, do you feel like it's mostly at the sort of like idea phase right now, or do you feel like you've seen any examples of like, oh, I think that's what that is? Um, I have seen examples. I, uh, I will, I'm like aware that we're live streaming. And so I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna say everything that's in my mind right now. Um, but I do think that, that we, va we tend to valorize, um, inside of New York and outside of New York, we tend to valorize and lift up a dominant model that involves a season, it involves subscriptions, involves a dual-headed leadership model at the top, and it, you know, they're, they're all the, they, it involves LORT contracts or LORT side letters or references to LORT, right? There are so many ways that we are holding up and focusing on one dominant model. And so the extent to which we can understand that it's not that everybody's working that way, as Todd says in his, many people are working in many different ways. So shining, practically speaking, first, yeah. we need to elevate, shine a light on, embrace, understand, and learn from our fellow travelers who are doing it differently. They are yeah. walking a different path. Um, and we can start there, just practically speaking. Yeah. It's sort of finding where are there like uh, the evolutionary early early adapters, right? You know, like they're they're doing something different, and how do we make it possible to thrive in a different way? Um, which I think is really interesting to think about, and I think you know is like a really good prompt for us in Art New York to think about. You know, I think we've long um, really valued and and leaned into 
uh, not wanting there to be one model or you know one way of making work or one style of work. Um, and I think that it's a great challenge to think even more expansively about like what aren't we even seeing because it's not on our radar yet. Mm. Any other trends or? Well, I, I think something we're facing, organizations are starting to pay their people better. Yes. This is out, coming out of the pandemic, this is a huge priority, and a lot yeah. of organizations have like really moved very far forward in this. Yeah. So that's on one side of the pendulum. On the other side of the pendulum, there people are cutting staff and cutting yeah. productions. So yeah. there is not as much work but for the people who have the work, they're getting paid better. So, you know, this is again one of those things that goes like this, mm -hmm. and, you know, the pendulum will swing. But I think one thing um, we can do as a theater community, there's a, there's a lot of doom and gloom over the course of the pandemic about people leaving the field. And there yeah. is some doom and gloom about that, but I also would suggest there's a beautiful narrative about that that could be uplifted. Mm -hmm. um, Daniela Topol is going to be a nurse, and she's going to be the best nurse ever because she, she has a theatrical background, yeah. right? So my husband's worked in theater for 20 years. He has now left. He's finishing up his master's degree to be a high school English teacher. He's, he's going to be, be an amazing teacher. He's going to be an amazing teacher because he's worked in the theater. So yeah. how can we change a little of this narrative to not just be, if you don't stick in the theater for the rest of your life, you know, that's it. Like, how can yeah. we say theater gives people something, and then they can move and bring those gifts to the rest of the world in different ways. So that's, I don't know if that's a trend, but that's something I've noticed. Yeah. 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 For that. yeah. You know, it makes me think about, um, well, two things that there was like a great New York Times article that you know highlighted like Tanji Brown Jackson and like all of these people who are like former theater kids um, doing amazing things in the world. And, I, and it strikes me that when we talk about our audiences and our communities, we're always talking about theater being additive no matter what you do, mm -hmm. right? That exposure for young ki you know, kids, having both exposure to and practice in the arts changes the trajectory of their lives. And that communities that have robust arts um, have better outcomes on all of these mm -hmm. metrics. And we don't apply that to ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't give ourselves the um, offering of like thinking about this being additive and expansive without it being like, an on or off switch. Mm -hmm. That either you're working as a theater maker or you are mm -hmm. not. You know, that, that that has to be like a hard, a hard line. And I think that that is a great reframing of something that I think also, you know, uh, does have consequences for theater companies mm -hmm. of labor shortages mm -hmm. or um, the, the brain drain that I think is real, you know. Mm -hmm. We will also miss Daniela and your husband <laughs> and all of these other people, you know, who, who have um, given so much. Um, and I think that that is like an interesting, that's a good reframe. I like that. Any other sort of trends? OK, great. I'm interested in um, talking about audiences now, since I just sort of like made a transition to communities. And obviously, um, I think, you know, I'm not looking at the data. There's a round table tomorrow about audience uh, development and marketing um, here at Art New York's Fall Forum. It will be live streamed. Um, and, um, you know, but I think that audience behavior obviously has made real changes. Urban environments have changed. We are living in a different world. And um, there are a lot of, I think, uh, also like new adaptations and emergent ideas that are interesting and um, great to uplift. Um, but I'm curious, and I think we'll talk about that tomorrow with David. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I'm interested in hearing from you all, like what do you think the relationship is between philanthropy and audience engagement or audience behavior and sort of donor behavior. Like, again, I think sometimes these are um, thought of in kind of opposition to one another, but I think that there's a real great conversation. And I wonder how you think about that in your practices. I don't, I, I don't love the word audience anymore. I, it, it, hmm. um, it feels too limiting in terms of what we uh, ask of our theaters. 
audience as we understand it, um, the person who buys the ticket and sits in the seat, or maybe they don't buy the ticket, maybe it's free, but anyway, they're sitting in a seat and that that is the, the dominant, not the only, but the dominant what metric we use for impact for theater. And that feels, um, it, feel, we've, it feels like we're over indexing on that particular indicator, mm. I will say. Like the, the, the um, I, particularly theaters with a, with a physical space, um, inside of New York, outside of New York, I feel really curious about what that, what that um, relationship could mean apropos public good mm. and what it means for uh, an arts organization, theaters in particular, um, how do they want to be s serving their public? And, it, and, the, I, and this is just my opinion, my thoughts are my own. Um, <laughs> it cannot, the only answer cannot be sit and watch a 90 minute, two hour, 60 minute, whatever play. It cannot be sit in the dark and watch the lights up. If that's the answer, then then welcome to 30 years ago. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and so I feel like the, the 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 opportunity for the reframe here is, what happens if we stop using the word audience? What happens if we use the word stakeholder? What happens if we use the word I don't I don't know I don't have the answers. But mm -hmm. how does the how do the metrics start to shift? Yeah, mm. I think that's so powerful. Um, you know, just thinking about. Um, the stakeholders, right, like involved in any production and also the premium of, of space, you know, and, and what can happen in the spaces. Are your stakeholders, you know, the interns, um, you know, of, you know, low-income young kids of color from the city who didn't go to college but could be technical theater, um, you know, professionals? Are you actively seeking out opportunities to develop the next, you know, generation of folks to be theater makers? Are you, you know, I'm focused on the youth. Right, so um, you know, but creating those pathways um, in, with intentionality of really exactly living your mission and understanding, um, you know, what what resources you have at your disposal. What are you doing with the space when when your theaters are dark? You know, even if it's just an hour of time, um, you know, could you program? Could you share that? Could you you know speak on a panel? Right. Um, I think just the more that we really lean into the network effect of um, you know of sharing just whatever time, time, talent, and treasure, as they say, yeah. um, is really, really valuable always, but especially now as we're seeing declines in the number of ticket buyers, um, you know, as, as a particular stakeholding class, um, you know, how to engage them. Yeah, it's, a, it's such a good um, reframe of, like, away from a transactional relationship towards, like, a relational mm -hmm. engagement. And, and mm -hmm. right, that that can happen in so many different spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, and it also does feel like it shifts away from, I think, another kind of like burbling whisper, um, burbling brook, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, sort of this other thread around like, um, it's the content, or it's the marketing, or it's the subscription packet. You know, there are so many that it's sort of like, oh, if you just do the right blank, then everything will follow. But it's actually like, maybe what we need to do right is the relationship, is like call it the right thing, create the right environment for people to opt into something that isn't Netflix and chill. Mm -hmm. And like that, that is actually like a larger way of thinking about audiences are essential, or not audiences, stakeholders, participants, um, engaged, uh, in, in um, like contributors mm -hmm. are essential to a live experience. And so how do we treat them like that? And not as sort of a like, but in a chair. Mm -hmm. That's great, those are good prompts. Any but, other? Well, I was just gonna say, because I don't know if I, the, the thing I think philanthropy can do is to invite and, and lovingly um, probe at that, that those frameworks and mm. enable and support the experimentation beyond the transactional dynamic. I th like, it, I don't know how long it will take to shift the, the culture wholesale, but I know it doesn't happen without philanthropic support to help absorb some of the very real opportunity cost yeah. of, of not working the way we used to work. So um, just to get really specific about that's that's 
thought partnership and um, and risk capital or risk absorption or whatever you want to yeah. call it feel like very practical ways that um, philanthropy can help move that needle. Yeah, that's great. Um, it also feels like you know thinking about what you were saying about DJ culture, live music culture. Like there's so much about live entertainment culture that is thriving mm -hmm. in so many ways um, mm -hmm. because they are these like happenings, mm -hmm. you know, that people want to be at. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there is so much to learn from that. And if it requires a shift from us in how we practice, like mm -hmm. absorbing that risk, but also knowing that there's lots out there that is working, mm -hmm. um, I think for me is very energizing. Mm -hmm. um, I just got the sign that we have about 10 minutes. The last question that I have is about what makes you optimistic? and what you're looking forward to. And I feel like there have already been some gems of optimism. Um, and so we can, we can share more of those. And then also, I want to provide some time that if you have questions for each other, or if there are things that I let lie fallow that we want to revive um, to close out, I'm open to any of that. But thoughts of optimism always feel like a good way to end. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe everybody just wants to go last and be the mic drop. No, no, no. There's so much to be optimistic about, but it's also just being in this room right now. I don't want to sound too Pollyanna, but I, the, the hard work that all of you are doing day in and day out is what motivates us to do what we do and makes us grateful to be able to do what we do. And so we thank you for that and look forward to many more conversations like this. But that's one of the things, one of the things that the prompts that Talia shared with us before this session was the questions we have for you all. And I know I don't want to hijack what's happening right now, but, but in terms of what we can do besides money, that's I think what's been on our minds a lot. The money runs out at a certain point, but what else do what else do you need? Like what else can we think about with you or do besides give more money? I mean, is it more sessions like this? Is it mm. think tanks? Is it listening tours? Are we tired of listening tours? Like what are we like? What like what what is it? I just we, that's what we want to know about. <laughs> Oh, we have some responses live in the room. Yeah, um, lots of them. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna table responses. I'm sorry. It's my fault. No, no, it's my fault. Great. Um, Did it's it. Great. We Did can it. facilitate that. I want to hear <laughs> other optimism, and then we'll throw it to the room for things uh, that people want besides money. Okay. <laughs> I'm optimistic. Um, I'm optimistic because um, the world has been changing. Always, always, God has changed, right? Change is God. Um, but the conditions of our shared and lived experience have gotten so wild out of control that I think um, the ability of everyone to feel more comfortable speaking truth to power um, and to sharing a, uh, a voice around what is not working um, has not, it's become more normal. Um, yeah. And I think that as a grant maker, um, and as a radical person, um, it's beautiful to me to be able to see uh, that reflected in what it is that's coming back um, to me to be asked, you know, for support because we can only support what it is that's happening, right? And so the more that folks are encouraged to take a bold step forward and say this isn't working and it could be this way, or to present that theater piece, or to have an institution committing to social justice ideals and not feel that their board members are going to have some uproar over this you know, being mm -hmm. a declared stance, right? Um, that brings me uh, tremendous hope, right? I think that, you know, I've, I'm, I'm young, but I've been doing this my whole career, and that is not where I started in this work, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so, um, you know, to be truthful in our exchanges in a way that um, is, is still fresh um, brings me brings me quite a bit of optimism. It's not a good reflection on where we're at as a culture, but um, it shows me I think where we're going. So. Yeah. I'm optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm I'm optimistic. Uh, seeing seeing the the work out there, uh, seeing the the new voices. Love seeing, you know playwrights and artists and names that I haven't seen before. I mean, there's a lot of amazing work out there. Some of it is hyper-local and understanding, mm -hmm. you know, 
evermore what these companies mean to their communities and, mm -hmm. and how that's growing and changing is, is really uplifting. Um, yeah, I, well, I tried to jot down a few thoughts. I think mine were, are sort of similar in that what makes me optimistic are really good plays. And the one that sort of came to me that has become symbolic of where I find optimism in theater um, was Ebony Booth's Primary Trust at mm -hmm. Roundabout last year. The play was so sad, but so bizarrely optimistic. So the play itself was so full of hope, but everything about that production, the, you know, the set, how beautifully crafted every design element was, and not on a rotating stage that cost a million dollars, simple, but so just, you could see the art and craft and the sound design and in the lighting and in every prop and in the costumes. And that show, that quiet little show, which really didn't come out with a bang, was impossible to get a ticket to by the end. And everybody I felt like I ran into in the street was talking about it. So if you can do a show like that and then people show up, that's what gives me optimism. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Um, I'm optimistic about the coalition building. Yeah. Uh, and the, the coalition building that is happening at a very public, in a public way, apropos like the professional non-theater, the PNTC, professional non -theater, Non -theater, nonprofit theater coalition mm -hmm. um, and, and the way that theaters across the country are moving together mm -hmm. a, across uh, budget sizes. But it's also the coalition building that's happening in the private. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of, what is it the ED call here? Fridays at eight, Fridays at six, Thursdays at four, Thursdays yeah. at three? Culture at three. Culture at three, thank you. <laughs> they are. I'm like, Roberta's always talking about the ED calls. Yeah. The, the coalition building amongst the executive yeah. directors here in New York, the coalition building that happened um, when I was an artistic director. They still let me in sometimes. Tuesdays, it's Tuesdays at three, um, and Todd London convenes us every, uh, every week on Zoom for now three and some odd years of artistic directors coming together, not to talk about co-pros, but to talk about to be humans together, yeah, um, and and that kind of um, that kind of stuff is like, oh, we're going to be okay. We're yeah. going to be okay. Yeah, I, I totally build on that for one second because about humans, like I also hope that this kind of panel um, also, you know, kind of demystifies foundations and gives more of a human face because what comes through in all of our conversations together is how much we care about the the field and as we said want you know everyone to succeed to have access you know uh to these funds to make the incredible art that you do and i think that um to just remember that we are human too and so we you know we need your help and we need um you know Speaking of some of the things that aren't money, um, you know, there have been some uh, companies that have done funders briefings recently, and I feel like that has been like a, a powerful, you know, way to gather people mm -hmm. in the room and an efficient way because yeah. we're humans with lives and families, and you know, <laughs> yeah. and we travel, and sometimes you know, um, we we take you know time out to go see the incredible work, um, and to remember that we are. Uh, doing this because we're interested and doing some of the, the simple things to um, to make that a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, to just give one final example, um, when I went to a site visit in Cincinnati, um, the sort of major theater in town ended up telling people that I was coming and not, not for a red carpet or any kind of <laughs> special treatment whatsoever, but just a chance to have coffee together and how generous that this theater you know, was to invite colleagues. And there was a colleague that was in from Indiana and there was a colleague that was in from Florida. And not everybody can do that, but it was, you know, again, it didn't cost any money and it was yeah. a creative way to um, mm -hmm. do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's great to sort of end on like the, um, reminder of like our shared humanity and our shared commitment to like a robust and beautiful art making practice and also to sort of underscore how important 
coalition building is, whether it's on your like hyper local, you know, people who all have offices at 528th Avenue, or people who, you know, work with particular populations, or whether it's through being part of something like the Art New York Fall Forum, or wherever you are um, in the country, finding your people and your fellow travelers have the conversations that allow you to show up. Um, robustly with your questions and and take some risks, right? Like find the places where you can say like, we're gonna try um, and find some partners who will maybe help you support that risk um, or at least like give you a strong pat on the back for having done it. Um, I think we can, yeah. Can just ask the people yeah. who, um, who raise their hand to yeah. talk about what what, what, can, can you raise your hands again so maybe we can find you afterwards? Yeah. <laughs> that is a great question. Also, like, we have time for a couple quick ones. Let's do it. Uh, yes. We're going to need to speak into the microphone, so I will try to pop around. We do have a short amount of time, so yeah. if it feels more popcorn, that might be nice. Is yes. a recommendation? Quick popcorn. Yes. Raise your hands. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say lobbying, like whatever support we can get to like the changes in the tax code that we need because that is where I feel like a lot of, of big change where philanthropy has a lot of opportunity to have voice in that. Like how can we make our government do better by us? Lobbying and advocacy, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just thinking about how you have, you all have unique access to these stories of successful paradigm shifts, successful mm -hmm. relationship building with communities, all the things we talked about. For those of us whose organizational structures don't meet the funding requirements to be funded by you, mm -hmm. it would be so exciting if you could share out your learnings from those companies that you are funding. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. What a great. Also, more transparency, if you don't fund us, then just be a little bit more transparent because I have applied to funders and then come to find out when I get um, some sort of um, a feedback, that's when they tell me, oh, you don't meet our requirements. And mm -hmm. I didn't know that from the beginning after having a conversation with you over months and I submit and then I, you know, I, I find that out. So to be transparent from the beginning about what your funding limitations are, that would be very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Along the idea of like shared coalition and making a bridge, um, the idea that like so much of like state funding went down the year that minimum wages went up, mm -hmm. and like that helping us tell that larger like mm -hmm. trend story, and especially I'm going to say it the elephant in the room actors equity, especially <laughs> for small companies that is such a hindrance to allowing us to have the flexibility to support artists from the ground up and move between tiers on the national and here in New York City. Yeah. Um, also along the line of coalition building, and you were talking about partnerships, you all have a whole group of people that some of whom we know, some of whom we don't know, but helping us facilitate those partnerships and maybe thinking about people that are not necessarily working with the populations that we're working with, who are not necessarily working in the sectors that we're working with, that we can get together and, you know, I'm. Yenta for us a little bit, it would be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, like um, I think we have to wrap it here. Um, I'm sorry, uh, there's one more question in the back, so for anybody who wants to find her afterwards, please do, but I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, it sounds like maybe this will be the first of many conversations we can <laughs> have. Like this. I don't want to assume, but it um, feels so exciting to be in this conversation, to be part of this dialogue. Um, I am so incredibly grateful to each one of you and the work that you do in the world, and to all of you for the work that you do in the world. Um, let's be in touch and have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you.